Good morning. My name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here. I don't ever wear a tie, but today I'm going to. So um, I want to I want to give you a little peek behind the curtain of the life of a pastor. Um, over the past handful of weeks, we've been uh, interspersed between the different campuses preaching. And so last week I was at Raymond, and two weeks ago, Pastor Dirk was at Raymond, and I was doing the announcements. So I came down to the front to sit and to get ready to come up to the announcements. And Bruce came and sat down next to me, and he, and he whispered to me, he said, do you have the wireless mic? And then I said, yeah, it's right here. And I thought to myself, is Bruce preaching today with the wireless mic? I thought John was supposed to be here, and then John still wasn't here. And then I thought to myself, oh no, am I preaching this week? <laughs> And I was like, well, here we go. We're going to do humility. I don't know. But. <laughs> and then with the last song, I was sitting there with my eyes closed. I opened my eyes and John was next to me. And I was like, thank you, Lord. So, <laughs> All right. So good morning. My name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here. We're going to uh, be continuing in our series that we've been going through for Advent. Um, grab a hold of a Bible or you can open up your, uh, you know, your Bible app, whatever you use. We're going to hop around the scripture quite a bit today as we dig into uh, looking at the character of Jesus. So when we started this series a handful of weeks ago, Pastor Dirk mentioned that character has been at the forefront for a lot of people in their minds because of particularly the presidential election. Uh, this question of what character is and who has it and what type of character are we looking for in our leaders, that's brought that question uh, to the forefront. I love this definition of, of character I heard years ago. Character is who you are when no one is watching. Character is who you are when no one is watching. And character is something really, it's deep inside. It's down in the core of who you are. The Bible talks often about how the way we act and the words we speak flows out of this center of who we are. In the Bible, that term is the heart. And really a more accurate translation is really the guts, the core of who you are. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart, your actions come. I was digging into some um, Bible research tool. Listen to the ways, the, one of the ways that this is described. The heart denotes a person's center for both physical and emotional, intellectual, and moral activities. Heart denotes both for ancient and modern peoples the beating chest organ protected by the rib cage. Ancient people, however, understood the heart's physical function differently than moderns. From their viewpoint, the heart was the central organ that moved the rest of the body. Ancients ate to strengthen the heart and so revive the body. Abraham offers his guests food so that they might, quote, sustain their hearts and then go on their way in Genesis 18. So if you think about character, character is who we are deep in our heart and our soul, that thing that defines us. And again, when no one's around, this is how we act, when there's no pressure to conform to, to social norms. For the person who's a follower of Christ, our desire is that our life is defined by who Jesus is and that there's an integration, there's a unity between my actions outside and my heart inside, that character and my actions come together. Why does this matter so much for us? Well, the first place I want to take you today is to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, toward the back of your Bibles. I want to just read this short passage, one of my favorites uh, in the Bible. It speaks to the idea of character in a really clear and powerful way. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Peter says this as he's writing. He says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. That first verse says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. So for you and for me, if you're a follower of Christ and you have the Holy Spirit, Every excuse that I have to not live a godly life has been eliminated because this says everything I need for a godly life has been given to me. And then he goes on to talking about we get to partake in this divine nature. We don't have the time to dig into it today, but there's something of divinity that gets imparted and we engage with when we become a follower of Jesus. At least in part, it's the fact that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, dwells in me. And so now divinity in my life are intermingled and intermixed. And then if you go to the next section, look what he says. Now, for this reason, because God has given us these promises, because he's engaging with us in this divine nature, it says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to your goodness knowledge, to your knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, to mutual affection, love. That entire list 
is a list of character traits. Notice there's not questions of capacity or ability necessarily there. It's not, are you a good small group Bible study leader? Do you pray really in a way that impresses people? These are character traits, who you are at your core. Self-control, perseverance, love. And then the next verse, after all these descriptions of character, he says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That verse says that if you grow in those things, you will not be ineffective and unproductive. So that switched around says this, if you grow in these character traits, you will bear fruit to the glory of God and to the joy of your own heart. This verse should be a go-to for anybody who's a follower of Jesus because our temptation is to say, if I do the right things, if I am involved in the right activities, then God will really be happy with me. This verse says, if your character is correct, then you will do the right things and God will be overjoyed with who he's making you into. These character traits, the, the promise after is to say, if we do these things and increase in these things, that it'll keep us from being unproductive. It will make us productive. That's what we want. That is why ultimately we're talking about character because as my character, as your character looks more like Jesus, we bear the fruit that God wants us to bear. And if you're a note taker, you can jot down Romans 8 because in Romans 8, Paul says that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. God has redeemed you and me so that we can grow into our character that looks more and more like Jesus. He hasn't predestined you and me to look physically like Jesus, but in the core of who we are. That's why we talk about character so much. This is at the root of what it means to live the Christian life. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the topic of mercy. What does it mean to be merciful, and how does that tie into this Christ-like character? We're going to take a look at the topic of mercy. We're going to look at God, and then we're going to look at our called response to mercy. Here's the question that I would ask us. At the end of the day, if we walk out of here, the question I would, I would, my desire would be that it would be in your mind is, do I see myself as a mercy receiver? Do I see myself as a mercy receiver? Now, I know probably the more eloquent language would be to say, do I see myself as a recipient of mercy? But I chose that language. Do I see myself as a mercy receiver? Because it's the thing and then me as the person who's receiving that thing. Do I see myself as a mercy receiver? When, when we talk about mercy, you often hear the words grace thrown out there. And Pastor Bruce talked about forgiveness recently. And those things all start to get mixed together. And mercy and grace particularly are often wedded together, but they are different. The best way that I've seen theologians describe and discuss mercy is to say that Mercy is when I don't get the punishment I deserve. Grace is when I get something I don't deserve. The analogy I always use is this. I'm driving down the road, not that this happened in Newington last weekend, but I'm driving down the road and a police officer pulls you over because you can't make a right turn on red, which I still don't understand, but anyhow. So I made a right turn on red, the police officer pulled me over. As soon as I pulled over, I said I knew exactly what I did. He walked up to the car, I handed my license and registration. I said, did I roll through the light? He said, no, you just can't make a right turn on that. I said, okay. He came back and he said, just be more careful, I'm gonna give you a warning. That is an act of mercy. I deserve, as someone who broke the law in that moment, punishment. If he said, also, here's 20 bucks, Go to McDonald's, that would have been an act of grace. He's giving me something beyond, okay? Those are different things. Mercy is you don't get the punishment. Grace is you get something different. Now, we talk about those two things a lot together because they are linked, but again, they are different things. Mercy and grace are different things. So what does it look like to be a giver or a receiver of mercy? Well, it happens in a lot of different ways. There's the example from the police officer. He doesn't give me the ticket. Somebody wrongs you at work and you have the right to pour out judgment on them in some form and you don't do it, that's an act of mercy. A husband comes to a wife and confesses and says, I have this gambling addiction and it's cost us a lot of money and I've been hiding it from you. And the wife, though she has every right to be angry and frustrated and, and respond with legitimate judgment, says, I'll offer mercy, let's work through this together. Now, in our culture, when you think about mercy, you might think, well, yeah, we're a pretty merciful culture because we, you know, we let people get away with things. But as you really reflect on it, my conclusion was this, is that as a culture, we're not so much merciful 
as we're forgetful or we're flippant. We're not really merciful because mercy requires that you engage with somebody. You look face to face in that interaction of saying, you have wronged me. I have the right to bring judgment upon you, and yet I choose not to do so as an act of mercy. Our culture is not necessarily merciful because we kind of just move on to the next thing. If you remember, not too many years ago, Howard Dean was running for office. And Howard Dean was doing quite well in the primaries. And then at one point after a victory, he stood in front of a group of people and started to celebrate his win. And he started to list the places that he was going to win at. We're going to win in Iowa. And then we're going to win in New Hampshire. And he started to list the different places. And if you remember, it was the famous scream. And at the end of listing these things, he just let out this kind of weird guttural scream. And everyone was like, this is, whoa, what just happened? And the poll, he just tanked in the polls right after that. Because they were like, well, we don't like that. I mean, it was merciless because he let out a strange... Now, whatever your position on politics is, that doesn't, that's not the point. The point is to say, one little mess up, and they were like, we're done with you. Now, if you take that and add into the fact that when you watch the news, if you go back 10 or 15 years, you would watch the news, and it would be, you know, Peter Jennings or Tom Brokaw, and you were looking at their face, and they were talking about the news, and every once in a while, a little image would pick, pop up here, and that was it. Now when you watch the news, you're watching the person, you're watching the other three people in the room, they're probably yelling at each other in the process of having a discussion, and then there's the ticker on the bottom that's telling you the NASDAQ and the latest reports. And the reason I bring that up is because less than merciful, what often happens is someone makes a huge moral, has a huge moral failure, and then within the next day, something new has popped into the news cycle, and we move on to that. Mercy requires that you engage with somebody and really have a moment of saying, though you have done me wrong, I decide not to bring judgment upon you or punishment upon you. That's the difference between kind of a culture that just runs to the next thing versus actually engages in mercy. And the last thing I'll say about mercy before we jump into the scripture is that mercy requires a difference in authority, at least in some part. Mercy requires that if I'm going to give mercy, I have to have the authority to bring punishment about in some form, right? So I have to, even if it's just for a moment, someone has wronged me, and maybe it's somebody who is my supervisor, somebody has wronged me in that situation, I am the person who is in the right, that person was in the wrong, and I have to choose to say I'm not going to engage with or feel or bring that punishment to another person. So in light of the concept of mercy, not getting what we deserve, it's smart for us to reflect on who God is, and then that'll bring us to a place of seeing and answering the question, are we a mercy receiver? To do that, I want to look at a passage in the book of Revelation. So if you'll turn to Revelation chapter 4 with me. Revelation chapter 4. I want to read this passage in its entirety. And then we'll go back and dig into it a little bit. Revelation chapter 4 says this. And after this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had an appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes, front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is a glimpse 
with all its symbolism tied into it, into the throne room of God. John, who's writing the book of Revelation, is directed to, brought to, caught up in the spirit, and in this place of seeing an image of the throne room of God. Now, the reason I bring this passage up is because if I see myself as here and God as slightly above me, then I see the mercy he gives as, well, he's kind of got an obligation. I'm a pretty nice guy. And we're pretty close in character. And so, I mean, if he wants to give me mercy, I guess that's a bonus. But if I see an infinite divide between who God is and who I am, and yet he still gives mercy, all of a sudden my perspective starts to shift. And I say, who is this that would show me mercy? And then I shift even more as I think about Christmas and think, who is this that would show me mercy in the person, the incarnation of Jesus? Let's look into this passage together. So John is, he's standing there and he's a voice. He says, I heard a verse, voice speaking like a trumpet. A trumpet is something that declares. It doesn't say a sound like a flute. It's something that declares and grabs attention, often connected to celebration and even to a declaration of war. So this trumpet grabs John's attention to say, okay, John, pay attention. He says, at once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, and someone sitting on it. I love that John says, someone sitting on it, because it's not as if John is looking at this being, who is God, on the throne and going, I'm not totally sure who that is. I can't, I'm not, can't make it out. It's almost as if he looks and he can't, he can't take the full picture in because of his finite mind. He says, there's someone sitting on it. And then he starts to gain clarity in his vision, see this picture, and listen to this description. Someone sitting on a throne, one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. Two precious stones. It doesn't say slate and granite. One who has the appearance of jasper and ruby. And then it says, a rainbow that shone like an emerald, another precious stone, encircled the throne. And so we're starting to get a glimpse, something, someone precious on a throne, and a throne designates or shows to us that this is someone of great authority, of rulership, and notice that the throne is in heaven. Not someone on a throne on earth, but a throne in heaven who's ruling above all. So John sees this being on a throne who rules all precious stones, and then there's this rainbow. Going back to Genesis, rainbow is a picture of a covenant between God and humanity to say, I will never destroy the earth with a flood again. And so we have this covenantal being on a throne ruling, and John started to get a picture of who this might be. Then it says, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And notice we have a primary central throne and then these other thrones additionally. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. 24 elders, most scholars say that this is a representation of two people from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, representing God's people, the nation of Israel here. Some say that the two represent the old covenant and the new covenant, but these are clearly people who are leaders but submissive to the ultimate ruler. They're dressed in white, which is a picture of purity, and they have crowns on their heads, so they are subservient to this king, but there's some degree of royalty connected to them as well. Now just pause for a minute. I wonder when, don't you wonder with me when John actually wrote this? Because it's hard for me to imagine that as John is watching this happen, he's like, hang on one second. It's after he gets out and he's writing these things down and he's had the vision is gone and he's not caught up in the spirit in this way he's written this down and he's reading it and going, I can't believe I saw this. And then the picture starts to become even more drawn out. They were dressed in white with crowns of gold on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder. Have you ever been caught in a thunderstorm with lightning around you? I was sharing with uh, the folks at Raymond, when I graduated college, a friend of mine and I, we went out to uh, the west to do a lot of hiking and backpacking. And one of the first places we stopped was the Rocky Mountain National Park. Now, we had done a lot of stuff here on the East Coast and Maine and the White Mountains and the Adirondacks, and we'd been out in the dead of winter and cold weather, but there's something different about the Rockies, particularly in that area, is that about every day around 1.30 to 3, you have a thunderstorm that rolls through, it's just the way that the mountains funnel the storms. And um, so my friend Bill and I are hiking up the mountains, a beautiful blue sky day, and we've gotten some new gear, we got some new crampons with these, these 
points you put on your boots so you can walk up ice and these ice axes. And we're kind of messing around with them in the snow. And then we look in the distance and we see this gray sky. And we think, well, we better get moving. We're going to Bluebird Lake to spend the night. So we start hiking again. And all of a sudden, the clouds are moving so quickly, we think, I don't know if we're going to make it to the lake by the time the storm hits. Now, in our minds, as East Coasters, we're thinking storm. It's probably going to rain. And then you hear the first rumble of thunder. And when you're so close to thunder that it shakes your core, you start having questions about, do I really believe in Jesus? Because I'm probably going to meet him in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so these rumbles of thunder, and then all of a sudden, the lightning crashed, and the lightning crash was not from above to below. It was on our sides because we were not around the storm. We were in the middle of the storm. At which point, I turned to Bill to say, let's get out of here and run back down to the woods. And as I turned, I noticed Bill had already said, I'll see you later. You meet Jesus. <laughs> so he took off running. So I'm running behind Bill with these you know, probably 50-pound packs. We're running down, and lightning is crashing around us. And at one point, the tent stakes on Bill's backpack fall out. And he stops, and he turns and looks back. And it was like something out of an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. I just went, keep going. <laughs> I ran and I picked them up and we basically dove into the woods as this storm exploded around us. It's one thing to be in the safety of your home and to watch a thunderstorm or to feel a thunderstorm. It's another thing to stand there and then to think those flashes of night lightning, those peals of thunder are infinitely small in the palm of an eternal God. That he can go like this and the storm happens. And so John is looking at this image and saying, this is who I'm seeing. There's lightning and thunder around the throne. And you can imagine his response. Now look where it goes next. Before the throne, there were seven lamps that were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, particularly for the disciples, when they're around Jesus, you'll see that there's always fear connected to the sea. The river was good. The Jordan, we crossed the river into the promised land. The sea was a representation of danger. And yet in this setting, despite the thunder and the lightning, they see, he sees this sea of glass, but it's calm. As if God has said, I rule over even that. That thing that has scared you, no, don't be concerned about that anymore. The next step, it says, in the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back. Eyes that see clearly who God is, I would assume. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third has a face like a man. The fourth, like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures has six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Again, the emphasis on eyes is to say there's eyes everywhere. These things, these creatures see all. And their response to seeing God is, day and night they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. If you saw one of these creatures while hiking in Patuckaway State Park, you would probably not go back. All of a sudden, Bigfoot would be a really big joke. These creatures alone, I mean, you didn't see the throne. If you just saw these creatures, you would probably be overwhelmed with fear. And yet these creatures, in response to the one on the throne, they praise and they worship. And it says after that, that when the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Now watch the flow of this here. It says, Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it says that when they do that, the elders fall down in response. So you have to wonder, if they're saying this all the time, the creatures are praising God in that way, and when the elders hear that, they fall down in worship. If they're doing it day and night, do they stop for one second, and the elders sit up, and then they go to sit on their thrones, and then they fall back down again, praising God again and again and again. This is a reasonable response to the presence of God of God. They fall down and they worship him who lives forever ever, and they take their crowns and they lay their crowns, their sign of authority and royalty, and they lay their crowns before the throne. And their response then is, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. This is the one who gives mercy. Now, according to the scripture, 
Back in Genesis, God says, if you partake of this tree, if you reject my direction, you will surely die. And Paul says in Romans, and it's echoed throughout the Bible, that those who sin, it leads to death. We will die. And so when you and I make a choice to say, this is God's holy decree of how I should live, but I will go my own way, the rightful response of God with no injustice is to say, you die. You know the standard. Your conscience bears witness of who I am, and so you will be judged. But he does not do that. And this should press us to a place of adoration and amazement to say there is a God who, despite who he is, just described in this one passage, we've only read, read one chapter. This, these images are all throughout the Bible. We see who God is and we say that we would have any ability to stand and to engage with him, and yet he offers mercy to us. Now, where is that mercy most clearly seen? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 1 to see a picture of that. Matthew chapter 1, the beginning of the New Testament. Down to verse 18. In light of the, the enormousness of who God is, the grandness, the authority, the elders falling down, the creatures blown away by who he is, all they can do is say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And now we see this image as God's mercy to us. Look at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Whether you identify as a Christian or not this morning, there is an eternal God who rules over the whole universe. Revelation 4 gives us a tiny glimpse of him. And despite the fact I am infinitely small, and he is infinitely large, that I am infinitely frail and he is all powerful, that I continually make mistakes that defy his holy decrees. God so loves the world that he sends Jesus. And that last verse, you shall give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So the question is, are you a mercy receiver? The answer from the Bible is absolutely. Absolutely. Undoubtedly. And so the final question we have to ask is, what do we do in response to the mercy given to us in Christ? One last passage, turn to Romans chapter 12, just the beginning of that, Romans chapter 12. And we'll close here. Now, I mentioned this before, but whenever you see the word therefore, I know this is kind of kitschy, but it will help you remember. You always ask, what is the therefore, therefore? Therefore always refers to something we have just heard about. Right? If I say, I was on my way to the church services this morning, and I had to rescue someone from a burning building, therefore, I was late to the church service. The therefore describes what happened prior. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters... The therefore really describes the first 11 chapters of Romans, which is a theology of the grandness of God, the depravity of sin, your state and mind in desperate need of God's mercy and God's willingness to give that mercy in the person of Jesus. In light of all that, Paul says here as he turns the corner, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your act of true worship. If I see myself as a mercy receiver from God Almighty, my response most naturally is to give myself back to him. And it's to worship with my whole life. If I see myself as a mercy receiver from God, it will impact how I in, engage with all people 
And Pastor Bruce talked about the topic of forgiveness and how I offer forgiveness to those because I've been forgiven much. Paul's kind of grand vision here is to say, if you see yourself as one who has received mercy from God, in light of God's mercy toward us, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, not one that is one time put to death, but that is regularly saying, God, here I am. God, here I am. God, here I am. What do you want me to do, God? How can I worship you with how I live my life today? But if our vision of God is small, then we say, well, God, I got some things to do, and you and I are pretty close. So. But if I see God as eternal and enormous, myself as tiny, I say, okay, in light of your mercy toward me, whatever you ask of me is a tiny request because you've already given me eternal life in Jesus. Do you see yourself as a mercy receiver is the question. And if you do, if I do, it should change us. A grand view of God and his mercy will do that. Let's pray. Father God, we're always in process in grabbing a hold of these enormous theological, biblical truths. And there is a way in which we have to put our efforts in. Your scripture says that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But we are desperate for you, even in this, to give us deep in our core an understanding of your character as merciful, that it would change us and we would live lives of sacrificial worship back toward you. God, the question is less about if we see ourselves as mercy receivers. The question is more, would you help us, God, to see ourselves that way? In light of who you are, in light of who we are, our prayer is that you would transform us and that transformation of worshipful lives would speak to the world about the goodness and grace of Christ. Jesus, we celebrate you in this season, that you would come, be born as a baby, live, die, and come back to life for the glory of your name and for the love you have for us. May that change us. And we pray this in the powerful name of Christ. Amen.